Randy Mosher joins me this week to discuss brewing fruity IPAs. This is Beersmith Podcast number 218. This is Beersmith Podcast number 218, and it's July 2020. Randy Mosher joins me this week to discuss creating the fruity IPAs. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent-pending Brew Commander is a high-quality brew house controller with exact precision and flexibility. The Brew Commander offers automated step mashing, boil timers, and amazing advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. I've just released Beersmith 3, 3.1 Desktop Update, which includes improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash pH models, and a whole lot more. To download your free 21-day trial, go to Beersmith.com today. Again, that's Beersmith.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back Randy Mosher. Randy is the author of Mastering Homebrew, Radical Brewing, and Tasting Beer. He's also a partner in two breweries near Chicago, Five Rabbit and Forbidden Root. Randy, it's great to have you back on the show. How you doing, man? Great to be here, Brad. Hanging in, you know, just uh, hold up in my little uh, basement workshop here and uh, um, working on projects, working on a book. You were mentioning a minute ago you had a new book in the works, not necessarily about beer, I guess, this time, huh? It is not a beer book, uh, but if you're a beer, if you're interested in, a, you know, if you're a beer taster or beer, want to be a beer taster or you care about tasting about anything, uh, it should be a really useful book. It's about two thirds about how it works and one third about uh, how to do it better. You, you forgot to mention the topic, though. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Tasting. <laughs> tasting. So, it, 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 so it's an... Um, really kind of a science journalism book diving into the particulars of the science behind uh, how we, our chemical senses and how they, how they work for us. So kind of uh, maybe an adjunct to, to the tasting beer book you did a couple of years back. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's designed for a much wider audience. Uh, one is just people who are kind of science and psychology interested, but others who are, uh, you know, maybe want to know a little bit more about the food they eat or the beer they drink or the wine they love and uh you know this should help uh, understand how we're kind of how we're put together and uh how what kind of techniques are used to get the most out of the tasting process and you mentioned there's a lot of interesting research going on uh in this field now it's unbelievable you know it turns out we have taste buds in our noses that uh function as a kind of a rapid uh, response to bacteria that uh, they can one of one of the sets of taste buds is for bitterness, and they can sense the back. They can sense the bitter compounds that bacteria use to signal each other with, and squirt out nitric nitric oxide, which is toxic. So it's this, so people who are so called super tasters who have a higher sensitivity to certain types of bitterness, they generally have fewer respiratory infections because their system is a little more robust. That's very interesting. So uh, it's almost antibacterial there, huh? Totally. It is absolutely antibacterial. <laughs> yeah. And it just happens like that without any involvement of the immune system or the brain or anything. It's just at a cellular level. Pretty fascinating. Sounds like a really nice project. Um, I, I wanted to ask you too, how are your two breweries doing? You got two breweries near Chicago that you're involved in, your partner's uh, in. Yeah. Um, we're back open. Our, our uh, Forbidden Root is a full-on brew pub, chef-driven uh, type of uh, menu. So we've been open for carryout. Uh, since, since, well, we never closed, but, uh, we've been hanging in there, uh, doing, you know, with a very small staff doing some, you know, what we're pretty proud of in terms of the overall volume of business. Uh, the neighborhood's been very supportive. Five Rabbit is a more a production brewery out in the suburbs, but mm -hmm. we do have a really large tap room and we're just, uh, uh, we just had opened it up 
uh, for outdoor seating, and they're getting ready to uh, drop one more level down to open up for inside. So we're hoping we can bring uh, some of that business back because that's been a big uh, source of revenue for us out there. So um, we're surviving so far. That's that's um, you know the best you can hope for these days. So uh, we'll see what happens in the next few months. Well, that's good. I, you know, I've been encouraging people to try and support uh, breweries that are struggling right now. Obviously, a lot of breweries Absolutely. struggling right now. So yeah, and if you're buying, if you're buying beer, you know, try and buy it directly from the brewery, because it's, first of all, it's going to be fresher and better. So you should do that anyway. But uh, breweries make three, three or four times as much beer if you buy it from them rather than buying it from retailers. Three or four times as much money, I think you meant, right? Yeah, three or yeah. four times as much um, revenue because yeah. they're getting all. They're getting the wholesale markup and the retail markup and, and uh, you know, so it uh, um, doesn't cost you any more, but uh, the breweries make a lot more money on it. So Yeah. Um, well, today you want to discuss using fruits and spices in, in an IPA. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the challenges you run into when doing that? I would imagine uh, IPAs are probably one of the harder ones to put fruit in, right? Harder they styles. Are a little bit. Yeah, they are, there's, yeah, they are a little bit because IPA is such a well-defined style in itself you can only put so much fruit in it and before it starts to turn into something else. And so uh, you have to work within that style window. The, the good news is, is that hops contain a lot of uh, chemicals that, uh, um, that uh, talk called, um, oh God, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, hops contain a lot of chemicals that are shared by a lot of different fruits, uh, especially things like citrus. So uh, a lot of esters, a lot of uh, um, you know other types of uh, other types of chemicals like uh, think about linalool and geraniol and beta citronellol. Those are the very very common compounds in hops, and they also are common in things like coriander and lavender and uh, all different kinds of citrus and and some other fruits. And so so you really have an advantage to kind of work with the hop chemistry. And uh, it's good to dig in a little bit to, to understand w what is the chemistry, and then uh, you can kind of match up uh, uh, your fruits to, to make that work a little better for you. Well, why don't we dive into a little bit of the hop chemistry? Uh, I know in recent times, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about how to get fruity flavors and aromas into beer, uh, primarily by using hops. Um, sure. Can you talk a little bit about, about that approach? Yeah, well, uh, so the, a lot of the recent uh, recent developments in hops have, have been breeding for more more desirable hop aromas as the market sees it. So the so if you think about a Cascade, uh, that's and all the sea hops basically that's part of the West Coast uh, pale ale and IPA sort of flavor. Mm -hmm. They're high in a in a compound called geraniol, mm -hmm. and geraniol, as you might think. Is a is a is a is a chemical. It's a part of that family. It's called a terpene or a terpenoid. Um, that that uh, and it has a, a strong rose or geranium type of uh, aroma aspect. I think of it myself as a very pungent floral. That it, that if you like smell a marigold or something like that, that has this like sharp. It's floral, but it's very sharp and a little pungent. And that for me kind of sums up. Maybe part of what people think of as dank uh, mm -hmm. in in those types of hops, and and so there are other terpenoids like linalool and citronellol that are a little bit more towards the citrusy, and it, and it follows the evolution of Amer of pale ale in a way or uh, IPA that we went from these sea hops and we then we then we found some hops that were a little more citrusy. Uh, think about like citra hops, for example. Yeah. Uh, and so we went away from that kind of dank West Coasty thing, and now we started bringing in a little bit more, more um, of the citrus things. And that was maybe I don't know, ten, twelve years ago. We started really seeing those hops uh, come to the fore. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, since then, uh, you know, right about that time, the New Zealand hops kind of burst onto the scene, and bringing more uh, uh, tropical kind of notes, a little bit of mango or guava or passion fruit, and those kinds of things. And uh, so those were, uh, you know, those started those started to become popular. And then at the same time, American breeders and breeders in Slovenia and Germany started working on hops that also had more fruity characteristics. 
it, it was interesting. I went to uh, the Crapper Conference last year, I think it was, and we were talking to an English uh, woman who was uh, whose family has been in the hop business for a long time, and they showed showcased a hop at that at that uh, uh, convention booth that was really fruity and just like smelled amazing, and we were really eager to get our hands on it. And she said, "Yeah, we discovered this plant in our kind of breeding breeding program about I think it was maybe 20 years ago." And they liked it, but they couldn't find any use for it in the brewing world at the time. But they kept it going. They kept a few plants going in their little archive uh, uh, garden. And then, uh, of course, in the last few years, when that sort of hop uh, flavor became really uh, highly desirable, then then they started scaling it up and, and growing it a little bit more. So it's interesting, you know, how much of that um, market is driven by uh, – driven by what consumer demand is yeah i mean craft, craft brewing obviously has totally changed the hop market um uh, you know back in the 70s they were making all these high alpha hops right yeah i mean that started in the 1800s even uh, breeding for alpha because people were just basically using hops for bitterness and really not much more and all those wonderful new zealand hops that breeding program was started i think in the late 50s or early 60s and uh they had they had uh, developed a bunch of really unusual hops, and they were kind of scratching their heads about what to do about them. And and sometime much more recently, they they uh, put those out to brewers in Australia or, or New Zealand to make some special beers and just kind of get like, hey, what do you guys think of these things? And it turned out that people just absolutely went nuts for them. And that was their first real clue that they had something uh, really um, wonderful on their hands. And so Nelson Savan was one of those and several of the others of those New Zealand hops, Motuek, I think. Um, and uh, so that was really the beginning. But it wasn't until they had validated that by by brewers and by consumers that they that they really thought they were onto something. So. And we're just really starting to understand the underlying chemistry. Um, uh, I, I know you mentioned thiols play a really important role. Uh, linalool, gerinol, all those things kind of come into play, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, the thiols, those are sulfur compounds. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing about sulfur is we're, we are ultra sensitive to sulfur because we have little nanoparticles in our uh, ar aroma receptors mm -hmm. that um, – and that uh, nanoparticles particles of zinc and zinc and copper, or I'm sorry, zinc and sulfur and also copper and sulfur, like are hugely attracted to each other chemically. And they think that there's something going on with those zinc nanoparticles that helps make sulfur really um, strongly attracted to these receptors. And so I, I know that people at Barth in Germany, which is uh, – I think they're the largest hop supplier on earth, or one of them anyway. They had to buy all new um, gas chromatograph equipment, which are the the, the um, analytical equipment that's used to separate all the different aromatic compounds in in anything. And because the the sulfur compounds are um, an order of magnitude or or more lower in terms of their threshold, which means you need Le it takes less and less of them to make a real impact on the on the flavor, and so um, they the normal um, GCs that they were using just were not sufficiently um, sensitive to be able to really uh, track these important chemicals. And and of course these these are the same chemicals that you get like that Sauvignon Blanc character that is sort of associated with passion fruit with that kind of latex or rubber glovey kind of uh, aroma that are, is very prominent in things like mango. Uh, so there's a number of them. You may see them, they're just normally identified by, by, their, um, by, their, uh, uh, by an acronym and uh, 3MMP. 3MMP is like one of them, and then there's some 4Ms, <laughs> and I can't remember all of them. <laughs> Them, and they're all like methyl something, something thiol, and you know they're 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 very long chemical names, so it's just easier for everybody to to abbreviate them. But but that's been a real revolution. And of course, the plants always had that capability anyway, and it really just took breeders. Well, it took demand to you know some but somewhere between breeders being curious and then finding something that's they thought was interesting, and then uh, getting the consumers and brewers involved to see if maybe there was a um, opportunity to to use them. So, 
I know the winemakers have been known about thiols for, for a long, long time. Um, sure. but on the beer side, you know, I think, I think you're right. I think the chemistry is just starting to catch up really. Um, yeah. Uh, and thiols, I should mention, only really exist in, in U.S. hops and, and hops that have U.S. heritage like the New Zealand, uh, Australia, right? Uh, you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure about that. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. The, it may be. And you know, the, the, all of those hops like Cascade and things are, uh, a lot of that breeding began with European parentage, like a Sots or a Kent Golding or something like that. Plus a, uh, wild hops. You know, there's a yeah. there is a a, 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 ra- a land race of uh, uh, or a, a species, really, I think, of uh, of hops in the U.S. called Neo Mexicanus hmm. that uh, is a component of that. So maybe that I, I'm not all that much up on the history of the chemistry of the hops. So um, that's okay. that that sounds that sounds about right. Well, um, in addition to the hop selection itself, you also have to. Uh how you use the hops has been really important and that whole technology has evolved as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you can take some of these breeds that have, uh, you know, varieties that have, uh, a lot of linalool and, and, and so on and actually use them effectively in the beer to get these fruity flavors. Yeah. The, the, the process is something that they're calling biotransformation and it's basically a uh, chemical reshuffling or a rearrangement of certain molecules um, like uh, g- geraniol and linalool and beta citronellol all they, they have a lot of common uh, aspects of their molecules, and, and it's very easy for them to be slightly modified by yeast during fermentation. And, um, and so what you normally get is you start with a hop that has a high amount of geraniol in it, and that's sort of one of the least desirable of aroma characteristics these days is that pungent geranium, floral, dank, West Coasty kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you if you uh, put it put a, a, a round of dry hops directly into uh, fermentation on the second day of ferment, like we normally will pitch the yeast, come in the next day, and add the hops. And and what happens if you have dry active dry hopping during real active fermentation is you get some transformation and a change in character of the hops that goes from that um, from that uh, sort of dank uh, geraniol pungent floral character and now it's starting to turn into it goes from there it goes to linalool now linalool is often described as having kind of an orangey characteristic like or maybe even like a uh, um, uh, what's That's the fruit okay. in Earl Grey tea, you know, that fruit in Earl Grey tea, um, the, uh, bergamot or, uh, mm. some kind of character like that. Uh, but it also has a coriander character and coriander itself is if they're making pure linalool, they'll normally start with coriander because it's like 50% coriander in the aromatic oil or maybe higher. And it has that orangey, also a little bit of a lavender type character because lavender is very high in, in coriander so now we're getting into citrus floral like a nicer kind of floral and then there's another transformation that can happen from um uh, linalool to beta citronellol and beta citronellol is maybe a little bit uh, like uh, a lemongrass type of thing so we're moving from a dark sort of a earthy orangey kind of characteristic coriander a little and then we're moving into uh, a lemon character it's a little brighter and again that's a little bit more desirable hop characteristic now if you if you start with a hop like cascade you're not really going to get a super fruity characteristic because it doesn't really have mu- doesn't have much of those styles and it doesn't really have a ton of uh, citrusy kind of components so you'll get a little shift uh, we like uh, mosaic is a pretty good hop to use with that because mosaic has a fair amount of linal of I'm um, sorry of uh, of geraniol in it, which is kind of its downside. So we don't like at, at forbidden root. We don't really like to dry hop with, with that hop later, but we like to use it early because it does have that geraniol. <coughs> excuse me, that it does have ger- that geraniol characteristic or geraniol component, and then that can be. Uh, biotransformed into something more lovely, but then its other uh, personality side is really uh, that beautiful kind of tropical uh, aspect that it presents. So, so that's a uh, mosaic's a good hop to uh, do that with. 
And so, I mean, in many cases, you're using multiple hop additions here, right? I mean, you're perhaps using one during active fermentation for dry hopping and then another one later? Yeah, typically for the New England, hazy, juicy, whatever you want to call them, uh, we do one dry hopping during active fermentation, and we do a second one on maybe on day five, day six, something like that. Uh, with the triple IPA, we come back a few days later and do one more at the end, just to give it a little kick. So, And of course, you're using a lot of uh, fairly large hop quantities here, right? Um, and one of the things I've noticed, some of these, even some of the commercial examples, um, you know, they, some of them do develop these vegetal off flavors or whatever, I think, from maybe using too much hops. Have you seen that? I haven't really too much. Um, you know, it's certainly a possibility that hops contain chlorophyll and things like that. But yeah. um, I don't know. It hasn't been a problem for us. You, you know, you need to keep the need to keep the mouthfeel up and keep, you know, uh, just really uh, work on the beer and make sure that the beer is the right beer to to do that with. Uh, those beers that have to have a real creamy presentation. A lot of fat mouthfeel, a little bit a hint of sweetness is not a bad thing, especially in the stronger ones. The market seems to like that. You know, some people put lactose in them. Um, so uh, that's not our favorite thing, but um, there is a market for that for sure. Well, let's talk about fruit now itself. So you're going to use the hops perhaps to get some of these, uh, you know, fruity tropical flavors into the into the beer. But um, yeah, you also, in some cases, supplement that with actual fruit, right? You, you absolutely can. I mean, the place to start, if you're just fooling around with it, when you kind of see where it goes, citrus peel is, is just amazing because you're, you, you know, you're basically boosting one of the characteristics that's already there in hops. And it doesn't take a lot of citrus peel. You know, it, for, for a batch of homebrew, you're talking about maybe one or two oranges uh, is all you need to give it a really a pronounced citrusy uh, uh, aroma. And fresh peel is generally the best way to go. You can buy dried, but but I find it's, um, you know, citrus oils oxidize pretty, pretty rapidly. Uh, and uh, so they, they turn into something that resembles furniture polish sometimes when, when they get oxidized. So it's not the nicest, not the nicest characteristic. And fresh citrus is almost always available. And so, so do you recommend taste. using oranges or what, lemons, limes? <laughs> Like, uh, orange, grapefruit, lemon, lime, you know, really, de I mean, it really depends on what the idea behind the beer is. You, you know, when I, when I, when I brew, whether, you know, it was a, ho I'm not brewing homebrew anymore, but I've got two breweries that I help with recipes sometimes. And, and we always like to make sure that we have the idea behind the beer first. Like what is it we're trying to do? Are we trying to tell a story? Are we just showcasing some hop or some weird idea we had? It doesn't really matter, but you want to get that clear first. And then you work out, like, what is the flavor profile of this beer intended to be? And then you work backwards, you know, from what you're, what you're really on your label description almost and try and achieve that. So mm -hmm. really, you know, do you want something that's really grapefruity? You know, we made a gin and juice beer at uh, Forbidden Root and that had juniper and grains of paradise and grapefruit peel in it and uh you know that was pretty pretty fun beer mm. and but but you know oranges are lovely and limes are lemons and then there's other things like yuzu and uh, bergamot and uh you know some more exotic things uh sometimes we've got a produce guy here in chicago called dave odd and he has a company called odd produce and he he one of the things he does in the winters is uh, goes down to Florida and drives the back roads and looks for like uh, derelict orchards and weird trees and stuff. And he'll like stop at the house and say, Hey, can I pick, the, pick these weird oranges off your tree? And they're like, yeah, fine, whatever. Uh, and sell them to him or wh whatever his arrangement is. And so he's come back with all kinds of very oddball things. So if you're in a citrusy area, if you have access to Florida, you may be able to find, uh, you know, find some real interesting exotics. Uh, that'd be fun to play with, fun to kind of talk about and showcase. Um, kumquats, fantastic. They're really rich in oils. Um, there's a there's a little green a little green fruit from uh, it's very popular in the Philippines. Um, oh God, it has a super like a sour orangey or um, sour orangey kind of flavor. Calamansi or calamandan. Um, that's wonderful stuff if you can get it. If you can get access to a frozen juice type of product, those are often pretty good. Although if you use the juice, you've got to be aware of the acidity um, because too much acidity kind of 
to my mind, can kind of sort of fight the bitterness, certainly can mask it. And it like, again, if you put too much acid in an IPA, it starts to not really be an IPA anymore and be kind of a bitter sour beer. Mm -hmm. So you have to be uh, conscious of that acidity. And you may want it, you may not. Again, it depends on what you're trying to do with it. So you mentioned the citrus works really well with an IPA. It tends to complement the flavors, I guess. But how do you get the flavor balance right when, you know, working with other fruits? What's the, I mean, what are some of the considerations of getting the overall flavor balance correct? Yeah, this is a, this is a bigger thing. And the challenge is really a psychological challenge. Because uh, I just had on my cereal this morning, I had fresh strawberries from the farmer's market, you know, which I always really look forward to. And, and when you're eating one of those fresh strawberries, you're eating 100% strawberry. And you have 100% of the color, 100% of the mouthfeel, 100% of the sweetness, 100% of the acidity. If you make a beer with 100% fruit in it, you get wine. It's yeah. not beer. So, so the challenge is in a normal, especially in the commercial production where you really are limited maybe to 5 or uh, 10% of fermentables coming from fruit. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Coming from fruit, then you're trying to basically trick people into into believing that this that this fruit really represents the beer or uh, that the beer represents the fruit even though it's the fruit is just a small component of the beer so what you normally have to do is you, you want to start thinking about well what's missing if i'm missing 90 percent of my fruit is are there things that i can add back to it right so uh sweetness is one a lot of fruit isn't really all that sweet typical Typical fruit, like a cherry or something, is maybe somewhere between 7 and 10% sugar. So it's not a huge amount of sugar. So almost you can um, uh, use a little more ingredients and do a hot mash, and you'll end up with a a, uh, uh, a little bit more residuals that so, will help. Yeah, at least um, some residual body and sweetness in the beer itself, right? Yeah, exactly. And and just making the beer a little stronger, you know, because um, the stronger it is, the, the more important the the more effect you're going to have from any residuals. And also alcohol itself is a little sweet. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so then you want to think about my, your, you know, so the, there's sweetness, then there's mouthfeel and having a kind of a creamy texture is also helpful. And that can be also done by kind of a hot mash or maybe use some rye, which also has a little bit of a fruity characteristic. You know, rye is a pretty nice additive for beers that, that where you want a kind of a base level of a vague fruity thing. I um, never, but, I never thought of using rye as a, as a fruit supplement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, it, it's, it's really, you have to just think about, you have to almost diagram it out and like, what am I missing and how can I start to supply those? And, and sometimes a little of this, a little of that, a little of the other thing, they have an additive effect that really can, can add up to something that's pretty, pretty powerful. <clears throat> Now, obviously, uh, you know, when, when we ferment a fruit, it, it it loses all of its sweetness, basically. And so, you know, it, it, I, yeah, I'm think, I, I work with a lot of uh, acidic fruits, berries, those kinds of things. And, um, yeah. uh, you know, the character of the fruit changes dramatically. Or the character of the flavor changes dramatically. Yeah, um, in lots of different ways. I mean, first, first of all, you do need to ferment it because if you don't, you're going to have blowing up bottles or overpressurized kegs or things like that, which are obviously not not good in any setting. And uh, the other thing is, is that a lot of fruit flavors are quite unstable. So peaches contain this uh, chemical called gamma decalactone. And gamma decalactone is that beautiful, they call it the fuzzy peach smell. You know, that's that nice biting into a ripe, you know, farm ripened peach, that classic peach flavor is this lactone chemical. And it appears to be really unstable in beer. And so you put it, no matter how much fresh peach you put in, when it goes through fermentation, that lactone, and I don't haven't really looked up the chemistry, but that lactone seems to more or less disappear or diminish great, greatly. And so uh, strawberries are pr pretty much that way. Yeah, stra strawberries almost disappear, at least when I've used them. Strawberries are terrible. <laughs> and and it's, strawberries are a very weird uh, flavor, too, because it has a... Um, it has a sort of a berry characteristic, as you'd expect. It also has like a lightly caramelized kind of a flavor that's almost like a cotton candy type of caramel, a, very, a popcorn ball type of very light caramel kind of thing, kettle corn maybe. Um, and then it has a bit of a, a butyric sort of a, like almost like a bit of vomity kind of smell or cheesy kind of smell. And it also has a rosy, perfumey kind of smell. 
Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it's weird because you take these four things that almost have nothing to do with each other and you put them together and then you get to a certain point and there, there you go, that's strawberry. Um, and the color in strawberry is very, very, very uh, fleeting, as are a lot of, a lot of fruit uh, colors are, are very uh, sensitive to fading. And that's another thing that's really important in a fruit beer, especially a, a beer that has a definite color. You want to make sure that there's enough color in the beer to, uh, to uh, convince people that it's, that it's there. So you can use a small amount of something like an elder, elderberry that's a really, really dark uh, that will give you a bit of that pink color. Hibiscus works well, although it does fade after about six weeks. Uh, hibiscus is about half as pink as it as it was. And and also with fruit beer, you want to with with a fruit beer where you're trying to manage the color, you want to keep the malts as pale as you can to get the flavor that you want. Because if it's if it's too dark, now you've got a beer that's really yellow. Because all those all those uh, darker malts are basically darker and darker and darker shades of yellow, and so if you're trying to make it pink, you have to overcome the yellowness by adding more pink. And so the only you you, you can make a pinkish amber, but if the beer is paler to start with, then the pink <clears throat> the pink from the fruit or the pink that you're adding, uh, like with hibiscus to as a colorant, um, you'll get more mileage out of it. So that's something to consider as well. So which uh, which fruits are are hop friendly? We're talking about doing an IPA here. Well, again, you know the citrus, but beyond that, um, I would say uh, you know any of the tropicals. A uh, passion fruit's wonderful because it's uh, very uh, powerful and definite in its aroma characteristics. Um, Guava is also quite nice, although it's not that familiar flavor to a lot of Americans. A uh, mango works really well. Uh, so that's those are three really great uh, kind of tropicals. Apricot and peach work well again if you can manage that. I I, uh, I found apricot generally does better than peach. You know the the, yeah. the flavor comes through almost as almost as a peach, right? <laughs> that's been my experience. Yeah, if you want to make a peach beer, use apricots. Yeah. But um, so that brings up the the notes, and because peaches and apricots both have this gamma decalactone um, chemical that that seems to fade away. Um, it's it's uh, useful to employ some of those aroma top notes. You can usually get them at the heart, at the homebrew store. They're just little you know three ounce bottles of uh, of a usually a, a clear or maybe slightly colored kind of uh, water thin liquid, and that contains in, in the in the best of them a uh, nat- just a distilled aroma essence from natural the natural products themselves, and so. What those are useful for, both in commercial and homebrew settings, is not to replace the whole fruit, because they can't really reproduce the full range of flavors that you would find in a fruit. But what they're really good for is coming back in and boosting that aroma after fermentation. Hmm. So, and especially with peach, you, you almost can't really make a, a very peachy beer without it. Um, the other thing is to remember with fruit is that is the acidity level is is different for every fruit and in order to to make a reasonable uh image of that fruit like a mental image of that fruit in the beer is that your your acidity needs to be in a similar range now with passion fruit for example that's a very acid fruit and so when you use it it brings along all the acidity you need well, that was Rather- something i was gonna i actually wanted to bring up i acidity is uh you know really high in things like a lot of berries you know extreme would be like black currants cranberries those kinds of yeah. things just uh but it provides structure to the beer and so that's one of the, you know i have a lot of experience using a lot of these highly acidic fruits with meads for example because they provide structure for the mead yeah the meads um almost- how do you how do you you know so how do you balance the acidity uh, working with something like an IPA or maybe a fragile beer? Well, I think uh, you know it's going to depend on what on what your beer is because if you like we we've, we've made a, a beer with uh, pear and tarragon we call it paragon and what we found was that uh, if you we do a lot of little tabletop experiments with a pipetter and and we you know we'll we'll get the beer through fermentation. And then we'll dose it with a little bit of that aroma top note. And then we'll start looking at uh, dosing it with some acidity to kind of bring the acidity level up to what we think is optimal for the beer. And we've, we noticed that if you, if you overdo the acidity on a low acid fruit, you take it completely out of its character. 
right? Because pears sense, like, yeah. have a little acidity, but you're not really conscious of that acid. And so it's like if you make a really acidic pear beer, your brain almost can't resolve the fact that it's pear because that acidity is uh, like a huge clue that's not making sense, right? So the, to have everything be coherent, to have all your sensory cues be coherent and lined up with what that reality of that fruit is. That's the most important thing. And that's really the way to think about it, I, I believe. Um, and so uh, be aware also that there are multiple different types of acidity that each, that fruits have different kinds of acidity. Acidity. Apple is uh, primarily malic acid. There's a lot of that in grapes, which is why they mm -hmm. do that malolactic fermentation where they're actually uh, using uh, a, um, Used in winemaking, yeah. Yeah, they use um, 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 a you know, they yeast. use a separate yeast or a special yeast that that yeah, uh, they use eats the, the malic acid or eat. yeah, exactly. They use the bacteria to uh, transform that that uh, it's kind of edgy, rough acidity of malic acid to lactic acid. So they use lactic acid bacteria, which is why a lot of Chardonnays and even red wines have a that buttery character. It comes from that lactic acid bacteria, lactobacillus mm -hmm. uh, fermentation that's used as a kind of a cheat to um, soften those wines and, and make them ready for a market a little quicker. But it has that buttery byproduct. Don't don't do you don't do that in beer. It's not really need, necessary to do that uh, for that reason. But but you do want to look like citric acid is super sharp with a little edge. Uh, malic is really edgy. Lactic is super creamy. Um, and rich, you know, you might like with a fruit like peach, a little malic might be kind of like add to the creamy mouthfeel that you have that expectation for. Uh, phosphoric acid is just super, absolutely dead neutral. It's what they use in Coca Cola. Um, so, so you want to think about that. Uh, you want to think about not only the quantity of the acid, but the character of it also. Um, is back sweetening or you're using lactic acid appropriate to try and get some more sweets oh, into the lactose? beer? Lactose? Yeah. Lactose, I'm sorry. I, you uh, said that wrong. You said lactic acid, okay. yeah. Yeah, lactose. <laughs> um, yeah, lactose is fine. Uh, I, I'm not the world's biggest fan of lactose. We, we've, we've used it. We've made some beers with it, and we find that it has some uses. I think when, when you get it to the point where it's really making the beer sweet, the sweetness has a kind of a – almost – to my taste, a little bit of an artificial kind of character. So I, I, I find we need to be really careful about how much lac, lactic or lactose we use. Although I will say the market seems to really, really like those super sweet ones. Uh, we've got a bunch of beers right, right now. You know, during the pandemic, our brewer has been doing a, a ton of one-off kegs. And there's a company here in Chicago that's been selling uh, uh, freshly squeezed juice in glass bottles for cocktail purposes so the cocktail uh, bars have access to like fresh watermelon juice and things like that and he's been making these sort of milkshake ipas and uh just opening the keg dumping in a bottle or two of this you know whether it's watermelon or some other type of freshly squeezed fruit juice and uh, then re recarbonating the keg and and serving them even with that unfermented juice in it. And we can get away with that. You certainly could do that as a home brewer. You talk, um, you talk about a back sweetening technique, right? You're Basically, you're going to stabilize the beer and then, and then go through. Well, or we're not. Gonna, <laughs> we're gonna finish the, we're going to finish the beer, but we're going to just dump fruit juice in it and serve it. And uh, so, you know, that's a situation, obviously, where you need to be in control of that keg. And yeah, because it it's going to kick off fermentation again, I would think. It will kick off fermentation and, you know, in a, like if it's cold, if you're serving it, you know, w these are all cold kegs, you know, in our cold rooms going through our tap lines and they go in a few days. So we're not really worried about anything happening in there. As long as you keep it cold, it's not really going to um, uh, restart that fermentation because your yeast isn't going to get going uh, in a new fermentation at 40 three or 38 degrees or whatever the keg, whatever your cooler temperature is. So it's not really a concern, uh, but it obviously is in packaged beer or a beer out in the market where you don't know that it might get warmed up uh, with a, a keg won't blow up from it, but it'll get over pressurized to the point where they can't serve the beer. So, uh, but, and those, and those sort of milkshakes or even um, what are they calling them? Like slurpy beers or something. There's a term for these beers that have a huge amount of fruit added right at the end. 
and you're supposed to keep them cold. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of stories out there about blowing up cans out there. But um, uh, again, in a controlled setting, if you're if you're a home brewer, got a keg keg cooler, or you want to package up some beer. Um, well, packaging bottling would be difficult because now you're actually putting yeast in and starting a fermentation. So I would not. Yeah, you can't really bottle but, um, with a back sweetening unless you're counter pressuring and then keep it cold and you should be okay. But but drink it. But I mean, you can stabilize the beer with, uh, you know, sulfates, sorbates, right? You do things. Sulfites, yeah, we I'm sorry. Those are not things that we normally use in the professional uh, brewing world. Yeah. Uh, um, and then the key, of course, with any of these things, whether you're using, uh, you know, lactose or any of these other things, is is balancing that acidity with the sweetness, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just getting that, just getting exactly that kind of right, um, that feel. You're trying to, you're really trying to do two things. One, you're trying to make a beer. And if it's an IPA, you're trying to make an IPA. So that has a certain boundaries, whereas if you go beyond that too much, then it really starts to be something else, which is okay. You just call it something else. But if you're really trying to make an IPA, there's a sort of a limit to what that is. And uh, then uh, you're trying to reproduce that fruit character that's in there as much as you can. You're trying to integrate it with the IPA and make it kind of harmonious with what's going on in an IPA, but also um, uh, make that fruit ring true, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, which is normally with the IPAs, you're almost always seeing yellow fruit rather than, uh, red fruit. Yeah. Oh, and I don't know whether it's just the color or whether raspberries really don't make for an IPA. Well, I think it shape. goes back to that acidity thing you were talking about. Uh, yeah. I, I work a lot with the, the darker berries and so on, and they have a lot of acidity in them, which gives structure to something like a mead, but probably, right. Probably doesn't balance well with the hops and everything. It, it can't be too much. Yeah, you just want yeah. to be conscious. Again, you know, they, like think about that fruit as your guide, and and remember that you can you can prototype a lot of this stuff really easily uh, on a like one beer worth basis or 200 mils or something, just a very small quantity. And I would recommend doing that if you're you want to play around with fruit IPAs, even uh, as a club activity, you can bring bring some different IPAs and then bring, you know, bring, get some passion fruit and some guava and mango and uh, make a citrus peel, uh, some different citrus peel extracts by, by peeling them and soaking them in vodka for uh, 24 hours or so. And whatever other kind of fruit, you can almost always get a puree or a concentrated juice or something Mm -hmm. and uh, just start adding and keep Mm -hmm. track of it and, and, and then have some diluted, citric acid, maybe some uh, winemaker's acid blend or some malic acid, some lactic acid. And you can really sit down and in an hour or so, you can work through a whole bunch of different ideas uh, and you can really fine tune what that what that beer is going to be. And that gives you a pretty good roadmap for uh, starting to scale it up. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, in a commercial brewery, you kind of have to work that way because you can't make batch after batch after batch that's not what you want. Right. And so, we really need to do that. Homebrewing, obviously, there's less, you know, it's just one beer, but you might as well get it the way you want it um, early on. And especially if you're new to it and you're just not quite sure where to go, uh, having all that stuff. And if you, maybe you decide that the perfect blend is mango and um, passion fruit, you know, or whatever, mango and apricot or whatever it happens to be. You can try combinations and, and with almost like zero risk and have a lot of fun and you can learn a lot and that will kind of show you the dynamics of how that's operating. Have a little sugar, uh, a little lactose, um, you know, just get your whole kit of possible ingredients together and then uh, just keep keep track of it. Get a, Use a little syringe or some kind of a pipette. Uh, something so that you know how much of what you're putting in. And then it's really very simple to scale that up. Do you prefer to add the fruit in the primary or the secondary? What's your preference? Uh, We normally add fruit towards the end of fermentation. So it's not the primary. It's, you know, we don't really in brewing, uh, commercial brewing, we don't really talk about a secondary. It's more of a, a primary and a conditioning. So we put it in when there's still yeast activity. Normally you're checking the gravity of those beers every day. Or twice a day, and you'll watch the, uh, you know, you'll watch the the um, the gravity chart go down yeah. and then the curve. And when it gets to that point where they're starting to flatten out, you know, you still have some yeast activity. It's usually maybe day four, day five, something like that. Uh, then we'll come in and put the fruit in then, because mm. if you add it too early, you're going to blow off a lot of that aroma. 
as Pierre, as Pierre Sellis once said to me, yeah, otherwise it is just for the neighbors. Huh? Well, I found you get much different character if you use it in the primary versus the secondary. It's just a matter of preference, I guess, depending on how you're using that fruit, you know. Could be. Yeah, again, yeah. You, you need to build up experience with whatever it is you're doing and, um, you know, build build your knowledge base. But and do, we, you use, do you use whole fruit? Do you use juices, puree? How do you, yeah, how do you prepare your fruit? Yeah, our, our uh, whole food whole fruit is really hard to deal with in a commercial brewery unless you have some specialized equipment for it. I would imagine it tends to float on the top. And my experience doing it with home brewing uh, was that it would float on top, and you'd get mold develop on the top, which is you know. Well, I mean, effectively, you have to punch it down every well, probably twice a day is best. Yeah, but. you got to keep punching it down, and then now you're introducing more potential for contamination. So, almost anything you'd want to use are are available in a concentrate type of thing. If you look in the freezer, you know, like uh, in the freezer compartment in your uh, grocery store, or maybe you go to the supermercado or a uh, big ethnic market. There are a lot of, all like tropical fruits, most of them are not really, uh, e e the, the ones you can buy in the store are not a good representation of what those fruits actually taste like, because again, they're picked early and they ripen in weird ways that doesn't allow them to be uh, as good as if they were picked and processed in country mm -hmm. and then turned into a puree. Uh, and so those are, purees are great. Juices are, fine but there are a lot of juice uh, you know watermelon is an interesting one and it, it res because of the flavor in watermelon is really delicate and it resists all efforts to turn it into an extract or a concentrate or anything like that you can buy those extracts and top notes and things but in our experience they've generally been kind of terrible mm. uh, so we made a beer at five rabbit uh, with watermelon I think we used 4,000 pounds of watermelon, and the beer at the end was 30% watermelon juice. Wow. And that was the right amount. Because, again, it's a pretty delicate flavor. And we, what we found is that um, for the, like the first two, three weeks, it was just like a first bite of a slice of watermelon, you know, right in the center of the melon. And then every week after, it became a little more cucumbery. Oh, no. You were eating your way to the rind. You know how it is when you eat that watermelon, you yeah. start to get the white part. And it's just like, it's, you know, if you like cucumber, it tastes fine, but it doesn't taste like watermelon anymore. And that watermelon flavor is just highly unstable. And uh, so the only solution is just use a lot of juice and well, drink the beer. Uh, well, I think a lot of people don't realize, but you know, anytime you add fruit to the beer, it does dilute the beer pretty substantially, actually. Yeah, it depends on, it, you know, I mean, less with raspberries, I, passion fruit, things like that, because they're fairly concentrated kind of flavor but i mean fruit is mostly water and sugar so you yeah. know all those things disappear when you ferment it so yeah the other important thing to think about is that there are certain certain fruits like i like i just mentioned uh raspberries and uh passion fruit that are very distinct and definite in their character right you 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 can you put one res raspberry on the table in front of you you can smell that raspberry you know for sure what that and, is. and raspberries actually survive fermentation pretty well too I mean, they, yeah. a lot of the character survives. Yeah, that's a lactone in there also, but that one seems to be stable. Yeah. Uh, but but um, but there are also other fruits when you eat them, they're perfectly distinctive and you know what they are, like blackberry and blueberry. Um, but, uh, blueberry especially has a real particular character to it. But when you take a bunch of blueberries and put it in your beer and ferment it, you just don't get that real true blueberry you get a kind of a well, weird egg. yeah the interesting thing about blueberries is almost all the flavor comes from the skin when you actually taste the blueberry the, the center of it doesn't have uh you know like an explosion of flavor or anything a lot of it's the tannins sure. in the skin that you're tasting yeah. and so yeah. like as you mentioned when you ferment it it really doesn't come through all that well yeah. yeah yeah and when they're making juice out of it or concentrate they're not really getting that skin you know they're pressing yeah. the juice out and they're ready to go it's like you take red grapes and just press them you get white wine more or less or yeah. blush yeah. so um yeah so you just need to be aware of what the character of that fruit is and uh you know with blueberries i don't know you're kind of there i don't know if there's really good solutions there may be some top notes where they have uh tried to adjust the ratio of that uniquely blueberry kind of character uh certainly if you can get wild blueberries those have a little more aromatic punch you almost to them. almost need like a pile of blueberry skins or something like that you know like they sell grape skins
Yeah, exactly. But you may want to like, you know, I, I don't know what you would, you'd almost need a crusher to crush those out, crush those down. Because if you put whole, whole fruit in, it's very difficult to really extract stuff out of them. You almost yeah, need to crush yeah. them, tear them up so that they're exposed. Um, so that would, you know, you could build something, I suppose, but it sounds like. Well, fun. Randy, uh, we're actually coming up near the end of our time here, but I wanted to ask, uh, you know, do you have any closing thoughts on, on fruit beer, fruity IPAs? No, not really. Just, you know, follow the fruit and, uh, you know, be true to this, be true to the style, but follow the fruit and let the fruit tell you what it wants, you know, because everybody, you know, you, you know, everybody listening to the show knows exactly what a, a strawberry or a blueberry or a cherry tastes like. And, uh, you know, you just like you, to have that illusion to really get that fruit to kind of pop into your mind. It takes a number of different sensory cues to make that happen. So, so follow that and, uh, it should be good. Well, Randy, uh, again, I appreciate you coming back on the show. Uh, always great to have you here. Always great to be here, Brad. Um, I love talking about beer. <laughs> And again, my guest today was Randy Mosher. He's the author of Mastering Homebrew, Radical Brewing, and Tasting Beer, as well as a partner in the Chicago breweries, Five Rabbit, and Forbidden Root. Thank you again, uh, Randy. Great to have you. Yeah. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. A big thank you to Randy Mosher for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're currently offering 20% off their all access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. The patent pending Brew Commander is a digital brew house controller with high precision and flexibility. The Brew Commander offers automated step mashing, boil timers, and advanced brew day settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander from Blickman Engineering. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. I've just released the Beersmith 3.1 desktop update which includes improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash hop pH models, and a whole lot more. To download your free 21-day trial, go to beersmith.com today. Again, that's beersmith.com. I thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.